running for me is really very important for my mental well-being. I make this quite clear in the book in that I've throughout my life I've gone through quite a few fairly dark episodes of anxiety and depression and although I've sort of been treated with medication and and um counseling and hypnotherapy and that sort of thing the one thing that is most important to me is just to get out and go for a run um it, it's amazing when your brain is all muddled and all sorts of thoughts are going on just going out on your own listening to the bird song suddenly you can just start to think things more clearly welcome to another episode of running tales the podcast that tells the extraordinary stories of everyday runners my name's craig lewis and this week we have a returning guest to the pod doug richards back in january 2021 michelle spoke to doug about his journey from struggling to be able to climb the stairs when responding to his young son's bad dream to running on all seven continents including in antarctica and across the sahara and gobi deserts along the way doug authored two books and this week i spoke to him shortly after the publication of his third called once around the planet It covers how Doug's running has now seen him clock off an incredible 24,902 miles. That's a total which is equivalent to running round the Earth's equator. I spoke to Doug about running a post-70 years old marathon in Venice and about taking in ancient statues on Easter Island, volcanoes and hot springs in the Azores and even the Bermuda Triangle. That's right. Yeah, it's it's the third book of the trilogy, if you like. So I'd previously published two books of my running adventures. D- despite the advance in years, there are still a few more adventures left in my legs. So at the end of the second book, I'd just completed my one of my goals of running at least a half marathon on each of the planet's seven continents. So in this new book, I, I focus more on running on islands. And so most of the adventures described are about running on various islands around the world. Yeah, and, and the, I think the big the big challenge overriding everything was to reach uh, a lifetime total of 24,902 miles, which is the equivalent of the circumference of the equator, isn't it? Which is just a ridiculous amount of miles. <laughs> that, that's correct, yeah. Um, I'd, I mean, I, I suppose I'm a bit of an anorak in that I'd, I'd always, from the very first run I ever did, which was one mile long, I've always kept a record of my runs in terms of sort of distance and the time it took and a few notes about the run itself. Um, Initially, that was just on pen and paper. um, But then in later years, I I managed to transfer that to an Excel spreadsheet. So it's all on a spreadsheet now. And so I could gradually watch that total mileage accumulate over the years and then I realised that I, I was probably only about one mile away, one year away from actually achieving that target. So, so that was my goal. So, for those people listening who maybe haven't listened to your your previous podcast, if I you spoke to Michelle before, they they may not know how long you've been running, how you got into running, without being uh, pejorative about it, how old you are now, because that's a, an interesting part of your story as well, isn't it? Right. Okay, Craig. Yes. Well, um, I started running when I was in my, I suppose I was about 33 years old. Now, I hated running at school. Um, couldn't see the point of it. I, I liked sport, but there had to be a ball involved. What actually triggered it was that in, in 1981, my son, Chris, ha- had a nightmare one night and I ran up the stairs to pacify him and I was out of breath by the time I got to the top of the stairs. And that just made me think I need to do something about my fitness. I'm only 33. I need to do something about my fitness. So I vowed to go out the next morning and run one mile. And that was my very first run in back in 1981. Nearly killed me. I had to go straight back to bed afterwards. But that sort of started things off. And then I gradually built up the mileage, realized I, I, I was enjoying it. And, and the journey sort of has continued on from there. Yeah, and, and for people who, who uh, are perhaps um, not so bad at maths and were listening carefully to that, they'll, they'll realise that if you were 33, I think you said, in 1981, and it's That's now right. 2023, okay. that you are uh, you are running into your 80s now, aren't you? That's right, I think. I, I've just turned 75. I'm not quite in my 80s yet, but I've, I've turned... See, my 70. maths is terrible, I told you. <laughs> so, 
I, age is beginning to tell, but I'm still running. That's the main thing. I'm still running. I will carry on as long as I possibly can. Yeah. So, Doug, tell people about some of the um, adventures you've been on recently, because you mentioned you've been doing some island hopping. And if I have a little look at the back of the book here, uh, it's quite exciting in itself. It talks about uh, running amongst ancient uh, statues on Easter Island, volcanic rim trails in the Azores, uh, lava formations. Uh, in Cyprus, uh, and even off to the Bermuda Triangle. That's correct. Yeah, as I said earlier, I, I sort of focused on on islands. The Easter Island trip was just an, an amazing experience. I mean, I was very, very lucky to to be able to go out there. Um, it, it's one of the most remote islands in the world. It's right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's thousands of miles away from anywhere. So it's a tiny island. But it's famous for these huge stone carved statues, uh, head-like figures, which are dotted around it, its coastline. And e even among experts, there's no agreement as to exactly who made those statues, why they were there, what did they represent, where did the people come from who first inhabited Easter Island. Some people think they came from the Polynesian islands to the west, Others think they came from South America from the east. And as I say, even the experts can't agree. So it's one of the most fascinating places I've ever visited in the world. I want to go back to some of the other ones, but is that adventure and discovery as much a part of what you do as, as the running, I suppose? Absolutely right, Craig. Yeah. I mean, where, wherever I've run around the world, as I say, I've run on all the continents and run in numerous countries. The run itself is just part of the experience. It's actually traveling, getting to see the local people. In many places, I've been lucky enough you know, to get into local villages, even to go inside schools in Myanmar um, and just get to know the people and see how they live because they live very different lives to what we live in the West. The sightseeing and visiting places and getting to know local people and customs it is all part of the experience of going on these running trips and is running quite a popular sport in some of these far-flung places that you've headed off to no it's quite amusing in some places you know you, you're looked on quite strangely if you happen to be running along a road in the morning <laughs> and some people think, what on earth are they doing <laughs> so no it, it it certainly isn't not not everywhere it's it's as popular as it is here and and the runs that you're doing out there, are you are you taking part now in organised races, or is it just you going off somewhere to have a a holiday, a voyage of discovery? And while you're there, you're like, I am definitely running as well. Right now, the the ones that I've described are all organised races. Many of them are multi day events, so you run day after day after day. There's sort of sightseeing arranged as well in, in between the runs, and sometimes travelling. I did a series of 11 runs around China back in the year 2000. And of course, that was covered a heck of a lot of the country, which is a huge country. So there was an awful lot of traveling and sightseeing as well as a daily run. So, so but they are organized events. Um, I do sometimes go off on holiday and, and just enjoy a run on my own somewhere. But most of the races I describe here are, are actually organized events. Yeah. And what sort of distances for, for people who haven't read the book yet, what sort of distances are you covering on those uh, events these days? Well, mostly these days, I would say up to half marathon. I did have a an ambition, which I announced to my family a few years back, that I would like to complete one more full marathon after the age of 70. And so that is described in the book. I went and ran the Venice Marathon. I mean, Venice is the actual city of Venice. It is, in fact, on an island. It's a lagoon island, the, the famous city. So I, I managed to run the Venice Marathon. So that completed my goal of running the marathon after I'd reached the age of 70. But I think from now onwards, probably half marathons will be my absolute maximum. But the, these multi-day races, that they involve a range of distances, up to half marathon, but on, on successive days. 
Now you've reached the goal of running around the equator. You've you've done the marathon after uh, after seventy. You've gone to all these islands, these amazing places, and run around those. Is is there another goal in your head now? Is there another book along the way? I, I don't think there'll be another book. I, I suppose my next next goal would be. I, I'm a bit of a park run fanatic. I do love my park runs, and when I do travel, if there's a park run anywhere nearby, then I'd love to do it. So I suppose it, it would be lovely to reach my 500 park runs, and that, that's about a year away if I can keep going at my present rate. So, so, so that that's a goal, but really just to enjoy running, just to you know, just to carry on running for as long as my legs will take me. And, and I guess that's the key question, isn't it? It's always the obvious one that we, we ask people on this podcast. But what what is it about running that, that makes you want to just keep doing it for 24,000 plus miles? Running for me is really very important for my mental well-being. I make this quite clear in the book in that I've, throughout my life, I've gone through quite a few fairly dark episodes of anxiety and depression. And although I've sort of been treated with medication and, and um, counselling and hypnotherapy and that sort of thing, the one thing that is most important to me is just to get out and go for a run. It, it's amazing when your brain is all muddled and all sorts of thoughts are going on. Just going out on your own, listening to the bird song. I'm, I'm a great fan of bird song suddenly you can just start to think things more clearly so so running for me is, is really important for mental well-being uh, and i'll try and help others as well who are in the same in the same position yeah well, why do you think running i mean you sort of referred to one or two of things there but why do you think running seems to be almost this natural tablet that helps us so much with our or cert, can help certain people with their mental health so, so much yeah, well, I, I'm um, I'm lucky enough to have spent, I mean, I've been retired now for getting on for 12 years. But in my working life, I, I worked in medical science um, and I've, I've spent a lot of time um, in recent years. I, I was teaching at the University of Birmingham and I know quite a bit. I've actually, apart from my running books, I've also edited a textbook about the human brain. So I do know quite a bit about the workings of the brain. And there are indeed brain chemicals called endorphins, which are released as a result of exercise. And I think it's the release of these endorphins that actually has this sort of calming influence on you. So although you may be sort of breathing heavily and, and your legs may feel heavy, it sort of brings a, a calming a calming effect on, on your thinking. When you're in the midst of an episode, and, I, and I'm thinking about this not just to get too deeply into your own mental health, but for other people who may be listening with similar things, how do you make yourself think, right, I need to go for a run? Because sometimes that can be quite, or for some people, might be quite hard because they, in the midst of a depressive episode, they might be thinking, I don't want to do anything. I, I don't want to no. go for a run. So how, how can people get to take that first step to getting out there and then feeling better at the end of it, I suppose? Yeah, you, you're, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, from my own experience, when you're in the depths of a really bad spell of depression, the very last thing on your mind is I'm going to go out and go for a run. You, you just have got no motivation to do anything. And that it's through that period that maybe the medication and the counselling can help. But once you start to slowly come out of that, once you start to think, oh, today I do feel a little bit better than I did yesterday, then I think that's the time when I, I start to sort of pick up running. You know, maybe I just go out. Oh, I won't do anything too hard. I'll just go and run for a mile and, and, and just sort of, you know, smell the fresh air, smell the fresh air and things. So I, th I think, you know, you're, you're right. If you're in a, a deep depression, then you're not going to do anything. It's hard enough to get out of bed, let alone um, actually go for a run. But once you're beginning to sort of starting to feel better, then that's when, for me anyway, running helps me the most. And running is certainly, I mean, we've obviously referred to it in relation to the to the book and the islands and so on, but running has not only helped you with your 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 mental health and so on on a day-to-day -day basis, but but also in terms of seeing the world and seeing all these fantastic places. I mean, you've run on all seven continents. It's incredible. 
Absolutely. I, I mean, I've had a fantastic life. It's given me a fantastic life. And I, I've visited places that I yeah, would never have gone to had I not been a runner. I mean, I, I, I was lucky enough um, when I was 50 years old to run Marathon de Saab in the Sahara Desert, um, the six day race across the Sahara Desert. And, and that was by far the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, but I've also run in the, the Gobi Desert in China and the uh, Jordanian Desert. I've run in jungles. I've run in the Australian outback. But also I've run in some very cold places as well. I did a, a half marathon in, in Siberia in the middle of winter and the temperatures were minus 25 degrees there. And that was incredibly hard. I, I've um, run in Greenland actually running on on the polar ice cap um, which is a mile ice that is a mile thick so you have to actually sort of wear spikes which are attached to the bottom of your running shoes to actually bite into the ice otherwise you just end up flat on your face <laughs> so that, that was an amazing experience and probably the most amazing place i've visited is antarctica to run a half marathon actually on on the Antarctic Peninsula it was just, it's just it's almost like visiting another planet it's just so unlike anywhere else in the world when you go out and run in these these incredible places I, I'm guessing as as you've gone on it's just like oh, I'm going to top it and go to the next one and the next one and the next one but how would you sort of start on that journey because most uh, most people who get into running, they might go and do a half marathon and then a marathon. And they might go, oh, I really want to do London. And and then they probably go, oh, that's cool. I've done all my great big running goals, but you've got that. I'm going to go up to all of these other amazing places. Yeah, that, I, I mean, I'm just fascinated by travel and different people, different cultures. It, it just, uh, you know, as I said earlier, the run is just part of the whole travel experience. I just like to try lots of different places, lots of different cultures, lots of different types of scenery, extremes of climate, if you like, you know, from the, the very, very bitterly cold of Siberia to the Sahara Desert. It, it, you're just exposing yourself to all sorts of different challenges. And, and the key to doing it is basically to research well before you go. So everywhere that I go, I research if races have been held the previous year. I see the sort of problems that the runners encountered and how how you might, you know, in terms of equipment and training, how you might actually be able to cope with those problems. Do you have support crews when you're doing those those huge events as well? Not not personally, no. I mean, it, the, the Marathon de Saab is very much unsupported. I mean, that's the whole yeah. basis of it, is that you're self-supporting all the way through and you've got to not only cook your own food, you've got to carry it around with you for the six days and carry everything with you. So, so no, there aren't support crews actually on the runs themselves. Usually if they're multi-day events, then you know, there's somewhere where you can stay in, you know, in the night time in between. Taking on events like this, I mean, we've we've spoken about anxiety and depression, and I know that sometimes those are not conditions which are logical, particularly in the moment. But I, I, I suspect running across deserts and across uh, the poles and so on, it must develop some sort of mental resilience and and self belief within you, I suppose. Oh, ab absolutely. Yeah, when, when I yeah. When I did that first one mile run after my son's nightmare, yeah, you know, if you told me where that journey was going <laughs> to take me in life, there is no way. And um, one one of the phrases I like to um, say to people that has prompted me to enter these strange races is, "Don't be afraid to scare yourself." A lot of these challenges scared the life out of me when I first saw them but then you read about it and as I say you research and you think well if I do this you know then that's going to help me and so by sort of researching you can actually prepare yourself for each of these adventures and then when you complete it you, you, you know you just you you can hardly believe that you as a person actually did that uh, and it, it gives you great great self-belief for future events to what extent do you think running can help people in their in their everyday lives? Oh, well, I think you know generally. I mean, it's now widely accepted that exercise is good for you. 
Now, people say that running it is, you know, very cheap. All you really need is a pair of trainers. But we, we all know that there's lots of other <laughs> stuff to spend your money on these days in terms of running. But I think, I mean, any form of exercise is good for you. I happen to love running. I mean, I, I know a lot of people within my sort of wider family love doing long walks, but, you know, can't see the benefits or, or can't see the joy in running because it's too harsh for them. But I think any form of exercise, we're all different. We, we all take to different, you know, I'm not particularly a gym type person. For me, just going out and having a run is all I need to do. And, and I just uh, picked up on that kind of then the rest of the family out hiking or whatever. What do, what do they do when you're running across Antarctica or Easter Island or something for a few <laughs> No, they keep in touch whenever they can. I mean, you know, that they they enjoy following my adventures. Um, you know, my son, my daughter, my brother, my sister, they they all they all enjoy actually following me while I'm out in these crazy places doing these daft races and, and I've I just enjoy and are just very, very supportive. I mean both my, my son and my daughter have both done some running as well. Chris, my son, has done some marathons and has been he, he he's in the armed forces, so he he's had a pretty active life. Um, so, so in some ways, they've followed in my footsteps in terms of liking running. As we mentioned earlier, you uh, you're now entering towards your or it's your eighth decade um, of life. Yes. Is is running getting harder now? Are you starting to find? Oh my word! This is a this is a real challenge now beyond what it used to be. Definitely. I mean, it's inevitable, but definitely you get slower. I think I seem to be picking up a few more injuries than I used to. I've been very lucky for my running career in having no really long extended period with an injury. You you obviously pick up the minor niggle from now and, now and again. Um, I seem to be getting a few more injuries and maybe it takes a little bit longer to get over them. But I'm still, I'm still, I can still, yeah, I've had a, last few weeks I've had a problem with my Achilles tendon and, and that's taken a long time to resolve. But I'm gradually getting back into a bit of walking and and then running as well. And last Saturday I was delighted to complete my local park run with sort of short walking periods, but I ran most of it. So so that So that for me was a bit of a triumph. And other than part run, are there any other uh, races uh, around the world or anywhere else lined up at the moment? Not, not for the moment. I'm, I'm tr treading cautiously. To be perfectly honest, um, the COVID pandemic hit me quite hard. I've run a few 10Ks since the pandemic, um, but I haven't really travelled very much. Um, the last travelling I did was the, the one you mentioned in the Bermuda Triangle, which was really as the pandemic was unfolding. So at the moment, I'm being taking it steady, taking it cautiously. I'm hoping to do a couple of 10Ks later in the year, local 10Ks, and, and then next year possibly to, to look at a little bit of travel again. Um, I'm actually looking at a, a race in Iceland, which I believe you have only just come back from. But yeah. there's, there's a, an Iceland volcano. There's a half marathon, but there's also a quarter marathon option. Um, which involves running around the rim of a volcano. So so that, you know, is probably a manageable distance. And obviously there's no sort of time limit. So so maybe that, that will be my next overseas adventure. Mm, oh, well, I can tell you, as uh, having just been out there, um, it, it's an absolutely beautiful place. Um, so, yeah, if you can get out there and do some running out there, then I'm sure you'll uh, oh, you, you'll absolutely love it out there for sure. Just uh, to, to kind of get towards finishing off, uh, I wanted to kind of ask you what you would say to anybody else who was back in that position where you were not being able to get up the stairs properly and and, and were thinking in the back of the head, maybe I should try running. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd say it just happened, um, I'd say it happened back in 1981 and, and that was the year of the very first London Marathon, if you remember. Up until then, marathon runners were just considered to be superhuman beings you know way above what anyone else could do and then all of a sudden on your television screens you saw ordinary people like you and I actually running a full marathon distance and it was that it was that that actually sort of made me think well if they can do it why can't I do it 
And and so yeah, I'd say to anyone who was in that position, who's you know, getting past, you know, move, moving in towards the the middle years, if you like, and beginning to think, oh, I can't do what I used to be able to do, just to give running a try. I mean, it, it's running today is very different. It's much more widely participated in than it ever was back in you know in my early days. In my early days, you know. You could enter marathons, but there were no sort of city 10Ks or 5Ks or half marathons. Um, the, the running boom has just increased incredibly o- over recent times. And so there's plenty of opportunities. Um, one of the other things I, I, I do in in my spare time it is I'm a run leader and I actually sort of run couch to 5K courses for our local council and introduce people to running. And I've run about 25 of these courses now, and I've got so many hundreds of people who I've introduced to running who just say, just they're, they're just so, so grateful. Um, and on the very last course, there was even a lady in her 80s who hadn't started running, and she started and she completed Couch to 5K. And, and it was just amazing to see the joy on her face. I think it really has changed a little bit actually running from you talk about those early days of the London marathons in the eighties. And I, I remember even growing up that the, the runners you used to see jogging around your local village or town or whatever were, they were super fit, athletic looking types. And and these days you kind of get all sorts of ages and uh, sizes of people and people of different Absolutely. abilities at different times running around. And it's, I think park run is partly responsible, but yeah, oh, I think, Park run is very, very responsible. It's amazing to see the range of people that you actually get of all ages, of all sizes. And of course, yeah, they're, they're even encouraging people to walk mm. the 5K as well. So in recent weeks, I've, I've had to walk six consecutive park runs because of this Achilles problem, but I'm now back to running it. But no, you, the, the, you know, anybody can do it. It doesn't matter. Who, who they are anybody can have a go at it absolutely right Doug, just to finish off i want to give you a chance to plug the book uh t- tell everyone listening what it's called where they can get it and uh and uh, i know we've spoken about it all but maybe another little brief overview of what it's all about yes okay well the book is called once around the planet um the subtitle is running twenty four thousand nine hundred and two miles which as you say is the distance all the way around the equator and that is a, a distance that I achieved towards the end of last year. I actually achieved it at the end of one of our local park runs. So it's the third book of my running travels. And, and on this occasion, I focus mainly on running on islands. So the Azores, Cyprus, Bermuda, Venice, which is the Lagoon Island, and of course, Easter Island, you know, a tiny dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You can get the book from any of, any of the big, bookstores waterstones wh smiths um you can obviously get it on amazon it's available in paperback or if you're a kindle person you can buy it as an ebook i I just hope anyone who who buys it enjoys it enjoys the journey you you you're you know you'll read that it's not just success after success after success there's lots of ups and downs but hey that's life it's how you deal with the ups and downs and come out the other side that that count. Fantastic, Doug. That's brilliant. We'll um, we'll obviously stick uh, some details about the book as well in the show notes for anyone who wasn't able to catch that. But uh, I'd encourage everyone. I've just got a couple of chapters in, but I'd encourage everyone to go and give it a read as well. And Doug, thank you so much for joining us once again on Running Tales. You're podcast. very welcome. No, you're very welcome. Thank you, Craig. Thanks again to Doug for joining us on the Running Tales podcast. If you liked his story today, please give us a positive rating or review wherever you listen to the podcast. Remember, you can also catch up with everything we do on our social media channels across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and on YouTube, where we post all of our episodes in full as well. Thank you again for joining us on this week's Running Tales podcast. Make sure to check out what we do on our Substack page as well, runningtales.substack.com, and we'll see you again next week.